Uh, hello. Um, so I'd like to thank you for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, I am mainly interested in uh, the analysis of partial differential equations that arise in general relativity. And in this talk, I'm going to describe what the main goal would be. And I will just present some uh, result of a simpler problem that we have uh, considered. OK. So uh, the general relativity is the classical theory that describes gravity. The main object of study is a four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold, uh, which satisfies, say, the vacuum equations, namely that the Ritz curvature is uh, flat. I'm not considering any matter for simplifications. Uh, OK, so what do I mean by Lorentzian uh, metric? I mean a differential assignment of a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form of signature um, minus plus 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 at the tangent plane of any point. Uh, OK, so this defines a geometry on a manifold, the, this, this kind of metric. But uh, this geometry is entirely different than the one we know from uh, the Euclidean geometry, the Riemannian one, in view of the fact that the signature is not um, only pluses, so we have a minus. In other words, um, in this kind of geometry, we have vectors which have, uh, which the inner product with themselves is negative, which are perpendicular to themselves, and uh, of course, usual vectors with the inner product with themselves is positive. So this defines um, three categories for the ve vectors. And um, this classification is uh, called causality. And it's one of the main aspects of Lorentzian geometry. OK, so here I have a picture. At each point, all the null vectors which satisfy this equation uh, lie on a cone. The interior of the cone consists of all the time, of all time-like vectors, and the exterior of the cone consists of all uh, space-like vectors. Um, in this kind of picture, um, an, an observer would uh, move on a time-like geodesic, which is the one for which, uh, at its point, the tangent is a time-like vector, whereas, uh, whereas light, or in other words, the signals, um, propagates along null geodesics. That's to say the geodesics uh, where the tangent vector is null. OK, so of particular importance, of course, is to understand the structure of all null geodesics, because that way we'll be able to see how the signal propagates in the universe. Right? <coughs> OK. OK, so as I said, our main equation here is that the uh, Ricci curvature with respect to this Lorentzian metric is flat. Uh, of course, when we study a partial differential equation, we need to understand what kind of equation we're talking about. Is it elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic, or? Neither of these. So it turns out that, um, of course, by this uh, formula here, we cannot really understand what's going on. But if we consider this equation the appropriate coordinates, namely coordinates which satisfy the wave equation themselves, we expect the same metric, then this equation reduces to this system, which uh, now can be easily seen to be a hyperbolic equation because you have the unknown, which is a metric, and you have that the second order uh, derivatives form precisely the wave operator. And here you only have either zero term or the first order derivatives. OK, so in other words, the Einstein equations are of hyperbolic type. And that is to say, the appropriate problem to study is the initial value problem. What do I mean by this? I mean the following. I, uh, we prescribe initially the space, only the space as we know it. That is to say, a space like hypersurface. Like, let's say a Riemannian manifold, H, with, induced, with metric G tilde. And we also need to prescribe uh, two tensors which is symmetric. Once we solve these equations for this kind of initial geometry, then we obtain a manifold m comma g, for which now um, this this uh, metric is precisely the induced metric on this manifold. And this tensor k that I described in initial data is precisely the second fundamental form of uh, the, in the initial of the initial hypersurface in the embedding. OK, <laughs> so this is the initial value problem in general relativity. I prescribe the initial geometry, and then I solve these equations, and I obtain the space time. OK, so we have well local, uh, local well poisonous results, but I don't want to talk about these things for now. OK, so what I will not want to talk instead is about explicit solution to the Einstein equations. And of course, the first solution what we try to understand is a trivial solution. So if we consider initial, um, if we consider that initially we prescribe simply the Euclidean space with the Euclidean metric, and also this tensor to be 0, so the embedding is completely trivial, then we end up with the, the, um, the trivial Minkowski, the flat Minkowski space, 
that is to say, a topological manifold, which is uh, diffeomorphic to R4, the and the, the Lorentzian metric is a flat one, so the curvature is zero. Okay, so this kind of manifold is a solution, the most basic solution to the Einstein equation. Um, so as I said earlier, the most important, uh, one of the most important aspects of the, the geometry of space times is precisely the, the properties of the null geodesics, because it's not the null geodesics that information propagates. Let's try to understand now the global properties of null geodesics in the Mikowski space-time. If we want to understand something which is global, in view of the fact that null geodesics are complete in this kind of space-times, it's better to apply a conformal transformation so that we'll bring points to infinity to finite, at infinity to finite distance. So if we, apply a conformal, if we can apply a conformal transformation to this space-time, such that the picture that we'll bring is precisely this one here. <coughs> So here we see that this is the life of an observer. This is the past end point of a time like geodesic, and this is the future end point of a time like geodesic. And from each point of this um, curve, I have the future null cone. And this precisely the limit points of all null geodesics on the null cone. And precisely, I can also draw, uh, similarly, I can also draw the past null cone. So I have done this here. So all the future directed, so this is the direction of the future in time and this direction of the past in time, all the future direct null geodesic um, have their points precisely on this kind of hypersurface, which as you can see from this diagram, it turns out to be a past directed uh, null cone. Okay, and similarly, all the past direct, the end point of all past directed null geodesics have their point in this kind of hypersurface, which is, uh, um, and outgoing Alcon. All right. <coughs> so what is very important in particular to see here is that all null geodesics, as I said, approach this kind of hypersurface here. And um, in fact, from any point, we have null geodesics which approach this infinity here. Okay, so in other words, the past of this infinity is the whole space time. So what do I mean by this? Let's see an example where what I said does not, uh, is not true. So again, I have here a space time. I have here the endpoint of all null geodesics. So here R is equal to infinity. This is all, all geodesics end up. But we also have a portion of the space time where the null geodesics, which live in this kind of null cone, uh, do not go to infinity, since in this region, R, which is the distance from, from an isolated system, say, is always bounded. That is to say, if I have an event here, then this invent can only propagate signals in this region here. So the invents can never reach infinity. And this is precisely the definition of a black hole. Okay, so a black hole is a region space time from which signal can never escape to arbitrary large distances. Okay. All right. So of course the black holes are very fundamental in mathematics, in physics, in uh, everything, in astronomy, in astrophysics. So what we want to do is to understand analytical and geometric properties of this kind of regions. <coughs> so the best way, of course, is to look at explicit solutions of the Einstein equations which contain this kind of black holes, this kind of regions. And it turns out that such explicit solutions exist. And the existence of such solutions is one of the main, of the fundamental, is one of the fundamental predictions of general relativity. That is to say that there exist space times which contain black hole regions. Uh, the main family, of black holes, the main solutions of black holes is the so-called the Kerr family of rotating black holes. Okay, I don't want to, dis to describe or even to write down the, the metric of this geometry because it's very complicated. But what I want to say is that um, the existence of uh, space times which contain black holes is not really telling us something very important unless we can prove that these solutions are stable. Because if they are unstable, then these objects are pathological, so we should not expect to see them in the universe uh, to observe these objects. So, so the Kerr parameter, uh, the Kerr family has two parameters. Right? It's the mass and the angular momentum of, that of the black hole region. <coughs> okay, so we want this family to prove. We want to prove that this family is uh, stable. So what do I mean by stability? Well, I mean the following. So let's assume this is, let's assume that this is a Kerr family. So this is a space time called contains a black hole. Let's take a space like slice. So let's consider the space at a fixed time. Then I obtain here space like hypersurface. Let's say 
I obtain a Riemannian manifold. So what I want to do is I want to take this Riemannian manifold that I obtain and perturb a little bit the geometry of this manifold. Right? Just change, change a little bit the, cater, the, the metric. That is to say I want to obtain a perturbed care data. And then what I want to do is I want to solve the Einstein equations and obtain a manifold here. And the main question is to understand how the, this propagation here, this or this perturbation here, propagates. Okay. Okay. So in particular, what we want to show is that um, the space-time manifold that we obtain approaches a Kerr. So if I start with something which is very close to Kerr, then I want to show that in the future what I obtain approaches a Kerr. Exactly. I uh, expect to approach one which is close to these two, a pair which is close to these two parameters. And this is one of the main issues in the stability because we don't know a priori which uh, parameters we're going to approach. So this is an additional difficulty. Um, and the rest of the stuff will, will go with 1,000 in terms of radiation? Or what? Yeah, exactly. That's what we want to yeah. show. That's exactly what we want to show. OK, this problem, however, unfortunately, is uh, completely open and extremely difficult. Uh, in fact, the, the most notable stability result that we know, which is in this kind of uh, formulation, as this kind of formulation, is the one for the completely trivial data. Right, so no black holes present, no strange geometries, no nothing. So we consider completely trivial, the completely trivial Euclidean space, which change a little bit the geometry, and we want to see how this propagation, these perturbations propagate when we solve the Einstein equations. So this was done, this was completely understood by Christodoulou and Kleinerman about 20 years ago, uh, who saw that the propagation, uh, the perturbation simply propagates like waves, and using the, wave, the decay properties of the wave equation on the flat space time, they were able to show that uh, everything radiates through infinity, that, and uh, so the space time approaches the original space time, that is to say the Minkowski. So in particular, they obtained this uh, global uh, picture for the conformal structure. Right? So again, you have uh, uh, infinity where all the null geodesics go. And uh, from any point, you can have uh, geodesics which go arbitrarily far away from the point you started with. <coughs> OK, of course, this is an oversimplification of the main picture, since uh, you can see here that the actual world consists of uh, about 500 pages. OK. Um, but what this work made apparent is that uh, if, you, if one wants to understand the same problem for black hole space times, then one certainly needs to know how the wave equation behaves on black hole space times. Because as I said, per, uh, the perturbations propagate like uh, waves. So if we want to understand perturbed data here, then we certainly need to understand how the scalar linear wave equation behaves. So a toy problem for the nonlinear stability problem is the following. Consider the Kerr family. So I'm not changing, I'm not changing the geometry at all. This is the Kerr family. We have an explicit uh, formula for the metric. I consider a slice which crosses, say, the event horizon. So I consider this slice. And on this slice, for which I know the geometry, I'm not changing the geometry, I prescribe data for this equation. OK, so I try to solve this equation uh, by prescribing data here and solving in the future. And what I want to do is I want to understand precisely how this psi will behave in the future. Since this psi in the nonlinear problem will uh, behave like the propagation of the perturbation, right? what we want to do is we want to show ideally that this thing goes to 0. So the perturbation goes to 0. So black holes, so the perturbed black hole will also approach the uh, Kerr. OK, anyway. <coughs> All right, so this is the problem we want to understand. Very nice. Uh, so uh, as I said, we're trying to understand the wave equation on Kerr black holes. So for a Kerr black hole, we have angular momentum. And the angular momentum has an upper bound in terms of the mass of the black hole. So the sub-extremal Kerr family consists of those black holes for which uh, the angular momentum is not the maximum one. Uh, the perfect psi is just a scalar. So this is a scalar linear homogeneous wave equation. This is uh, the simplest uh, I can do. So if uh, we see earlier, uh, the, wave, the Einstein equations is not really, um, in terms of in, in this gauge, 
it's not really a wave equation in terms of the metric components. It's a quasi-linear equation because this thing depends on this thing. This thing depends on this thing. But so what I'm doing here is the, the, the simplest possible problem, a scalar linear wave equation on this kind of geometry. OK. So if I consider now black holes uh, for which the angular momentum is not a maximum one, then these are the subjects in black holes. Then uh, the Fermos and Runyansky have proved that uh, if you have a solution to the wave equation on such uh, black holes, then indeed psi and all the derivatives of psi decay, where t is like a time parameter. So t goes to infinity in this direction. So indeed, these things go to 0. These are just um, constants, and these are in diesel data. So all these things are finite, so this goes to 0. So we obtain these quantitative uh, decay estimates. For psi, for the sub-extremal case. OK, so my contribution to this problem lies in the extremal case. Right? So the methods, for this, the methods of this work for the sub-extremal case to, could not work for the extremal case. So what we saw for the extremal case is the following. If we consider axisymmetric solutions to the wave equation in the extremal case, then again, psi, the point wise, the infinity norm of psi, will decay with a slowly, slower, slower rate. So here we have 1 over t. Here we have 1 over 3 halves, 3 fifths. Um, so the rate is lower, but at least it decays. But what more surprisingly we saw is that generically, if I consider a vector field which is transversal to the event horizon, which I call by y, then this derivative of, of uh, psi, the y derivative of psi, does not decay on the event horizon of the extremal curve. And in fact, if I consider higher order derivatives, y, y, psi, then these derivatives uh, blow up along the event horizon. Okay? That is to say, under scalar perturbations, the event horizon of extremal black holes is unstable. Okay? That was uh, something entirely new in, terms of, uh, in the context of this linearized stability problem. Okay, and we have uh, similar blow up results for L2 norms. Let me just here mention that this blow up does not depend at all on the size of the initial data. Here I can have initial data which are as close as we want to the trivial, to the zero data. Generically, <laughs> exactly. So this is exactly what I would finish with. What does it say about the inner problem? The real problem is something that we want to do this year, right? In this institute or in Princeton? I mean, this is uh, certainly, certainly. So, um, so we, we want to solve the stability of the sub-extremal care. Right? This is a, the main biggest problem. But in view of the previous of this work, we now have another equally important and probably more difficult problem, which is to understand the instabilities, the nonlinear instabilities of extremal care. Right? To understand. Uh, so you mean of extremal care or of? Uh, Exactly, right. exactly. So what I'm saying is that I need to solve this block in this thing that's blowing up this year. So, so for the sub-extremal case, uh, the modes are as they should be, so they couldn't see any instability. They only saw instability for the sub-extremal. So for the extremal case, no work had been done. And after this work, uh, physics started working on the modes, and they were able to extend these uh, blow-up results for gravitational for the course equation, that is to say, for the gravitational instability, uh, for the gravitational <laughs> gravitational questions of uh, the linearized gravitational questions uh, for the extremal care. So we have linearized in this is non-linear, li non but linearized uh, instability of extremal care. Yes, and as I said, uh, to understand in the full non-linear problem, the, the effect of this uh, linear instabilities is uh, something we want to understand. So I will finish here and thank you very much. Thank you very much.